Greetings and salutations. You lovely individuals, welcome inside another epi of League Unlock. We got some some marquee matchups again heading into a Friday. It wasn't Gen G versus T1. It's Gen G 1.5 versus T1. And that was definitely what it was on the rift because Doran, Peanut, and Delight, I think they just looked at each other before this match and said, guys, we're on the Gen G team that had T1's number for multiple years. Why don't we just do that against them? And they did. I can't remember the name of it, but it's got to be like that old movie where the you know Earth is invaded by aliens, and the only way you can see them are these special glasses that the guy puts on, type of thing. That has to be it for the Gen G players. They're able to put on those special glasses and view T1 as human, and they're able to play against them and take it that type of way. And that is really the the only way to sum up what we saw throughout this series today: a rise up, a leveling up, and a takedown from Mr. Hanwha Life. Not only did they hand Zeus his first loss on Aatrox of the split, but they do it twice. Doran has his number in those matchups, and more importantly, Peanut was two, three, four steps ahead of owner this entire series, and Hanma as a whole. Listen, we've seen flanks and different sneaky maneuvers out of T1 all split, but Hanma had map control both of their wins at the very least they had it on lockdown t1 just couldn't find any angles to get back in these games and i need to know who is the monster responsible for teaching peanut how to play poppy a couple of years ago because this is one of those ones that was not there at the beginning of my boy's career he has quickly picked up on this champion and shown a mastery on how to be the most annoying threat out there on the rift when he's rocking that that you know pippy long stocking haired poppy out there on the rift dancing around bopping you with that hammer yeah he like i said was doing more damage than owners Lee sin he didn't even die on that poppy pick follows it up with the other win on the maokai of course but uh i mean smolder the big win obviously double digit kills for viper in that third game but and listen, Faker was actually probably the best performing T1 member across this series, but Zeka stepped up in a huge way. This was fully a top to bottom, top level performance from Hanwha Life and one that we've been waiting for, for them to prove themselves against one of the top two LCK squads. Yeah, I think there's obviously room here to be disappointed as a T1 fan, and especially coming off of what was a disappointing performance against Gen G. You had a little, you know, little bounce back here for T1, but of course, knowing where that strength of schedule is and looking at these two matches as the ones that mattered towards the finish line that you wanted to see a good performance. You needed that bounce back before playoffs. Didn't quite get that. Yes, you did see Faker play play a good role in this series. Was impactful. Wasn't locked down into lane the same way he was with um, Chovy in the Gen G series. Didn't get the same effect that he has against other mid laners. The way that he has been able to roam around, help out T1 around the map, and keep things going because Zeka was a factor when it came down to these later team fights, and he was making sure that he was clutch in those team fights for this Hanwha Life team already laid out the old gen g members they got it done zeka getting it done as the hanwa life member staying around from last year and i know people overreact one way or another for t1 more than any other team on the planet but now you drop a series to gen g you get smashed by them you're 2 od plus but it's i'm not gonna call it shaky but not convincing and then you follow that up with the series loss to hanwa you know, now people are saying Zeus is just an Aatrox one trick. If Guma and Kyria have to play meta standard, they're not as lethal to bot lane and owner should be benched. These all seem like appropriate reactions, right? Uh, they, uh, maybe if you're the, the guy next up on the phone calls to call the trucks around the T1 head queue, they, maybe you're it's thinking Guan that makes sense. who's dropping these lines, you know. All right, bench no, owner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. That massive overreactions type of thing. And I can understand, given how important the series against Gen G was and how poorly it went. And then, of course, wanting that rebound, that path to Ascension to be right back up there with Gen G doesn't quite work like that. And of course, Hanwha Life, a very good, very strong team in the LCK. One of these ones that we've been asking to be able to make that push up from that barrier underneath that top two in the LCK. 
this series, these performances from Zeka and Viper as those two mainstays on Hanwha Life combined with the new players, this is a Gen G, not Gen G, excuse me, Hanwha Life that has shown that they can compete with the T1s and the Gen Gs in the LCK. And prove that they are absolutely a cut above the rest of those teams below them when they are having a solid day on the Rift. It doesn't mean there's not some cause for concern uh, for T1 over the last couple of uh, series, I guess, for them. But still, 13-3, and three, this is a playoff team. You're waiting for them to roll around when the best of fives kick off. And there's no better example of a good team and not caring about the regular season as much than what Cloud9 just did to 100 Thieves because they hardly for a month gave us much that we were really excited about this super team and then boom first playoff series they have their three best games of the entire split back to back to back maybe the scrim rumors were actually true for 100 Thieves because they got bodied man my feelings condolences out to anybody that was making the predictions and trying to be fair to 100 thieves in that situation because you did not deserve to get blasted with three games straight of the best games that we have seen from this cloud nine roster at any point the way that they played this year this series top to bottom and i really mean that top lane mr fudge all the way through down to that bottom lane with berserker popping off it was fantastic stuff from Cloud9 on this day. I'm trying to think of a point in this series where it was competitive. And I mean, once the minions spawned in game one, like this was, <laughs> there was all three games. Cloud9 had at least a 4K gold lead at 15 minutes and they were finishing with 10K, 12K, 15K gold leads by the time these games were done and dusted. 100 Thieves got two turrets the entire series. I will say, even with those early advantages, which is something that we talked about, one of the things that Cloud9 was going to have, no matter what that was going to happen in this series, they had that advantage on the early game and how things went. It was all about closing it out. They showed that you build early game advantages like that, you play like you do in the day, you got that snowball rolling. We yeah, talked the about snowball them. was a lot bigger today than it's been in the regular We're season. We're building it and dropping it, man. They're going for the Guinness Brick World Record of snowball today on building that snowman. It was the way that it was rolling. Popside Fudge answered the call that we dished out to him. We talked about the champion pool, talked about the differences in performance heading into this series of General Sniper and how he was on the rise. Fudge dishes out a little bit of a, a learning lesson for the young guy in the in the L LCS. You move into the jungle, of course, a little bit more, you know, even type of matchup. But I still think Blabber more so had his way and what he wanted to do and how he wanted to impact this series. Jojo Pyun steps right up and delivers that MVP level of performance, that mega difference carry in the mid lane. And you go down to that bottom lane, Berserker and Vulcan, take it individually, take it 2v2. That was their best series of the whole year, no question. And this third game really just felt like a desperation team comp out of 100 Thieves. The Rumble, Rel, Yasuo for Quid. They were just trying to cook something up, but uh, it was some dubious type of food. And, you know, Sniper, the solo kill god from the regular season, channeling his inner, the Shy. Unfortunately, he went too far with the Shy on the day. 1-12-4 and four did the run, young rookie put up. We thought would be an advantage for 100 Thieves, but yeah, Fudge steps up on the day. He's a rookie. There's going to be lots of learning curves for this 100 Thieves roster, case in point, this series. It, it, it looks so bad because 100 Thieves, I think individually, a lot of these players had a rough time with the pressure, with the moment, all these things, and then adapting once things started to go so south for the team in those matches consecutively is one of those things. And then realizing that, yes, Cloud9 did have the three best games that we have seen from this iteration of this lineup at any point is one of those things you got to keep in that, you know, mix of how it was up and how it was down type of thing. Moving on from here, number one, Cloud9, keep this rolling. If you keep playing like this, this is going to be an LCS team that demands respect, not just from the LCS fandom, but from the rest of the world internationally. If you can keep at this type of pace, this type of lethality, that's what we want to see. That's what we need to see from a front runner in the LCS at this point. And for 100 Thieves, you did the work. Jojo Pyun, you're wrong. Regular season does matter some little bit. It matters because the 100 Thieves don't find themselves in that low, lower bracket right off the jump. 
now they're in that type of situation you get a chance to respond bounce back take lessons from this one and take it against another opponent here it ain't over just in the spring for 100 thieves just yet yeah and we'll see how quickly this young roster can learn and adapt is their confidence completely shattered by getting dismantled from cloud nine or are they excited at the opportunity to prove themselves again in that lower bracket run and either way it goes both of those ones are, are things to keep track of with the learning experience the growth for this type of roster it is that important time to check in and it's not that excuse type of check in for these young players it's understanding how you know growth is not just this linear path it's going to be up down sideways backwards all these type of things and if you're supportive during all those times the fruits that you're going to gain when it is the positives are only greater we're not even at msi yet but i'm ready to hand a world's ticket to Fun Plus Phoenix because this team is just too damn exciting to watch in the LPL. A pair of rising young squads matching up them against IG and they absolutely dumpster them in 2-0 fashion and they're styling on them. Another series where we get to see life absolutely cooking on the support rumble pick. Oh man, he was grilling on the rumble down Dang. in that bottom lane, keeping that flame spitter going making sure the heat was always on to IG. Yes, FPX rolls through, and I gotta be there right with you. I want this team, I need this team. An international event as soon as possible, give me MSI. I know every type of year, there's one or two teams that pop up, all right? That fresh flavor of the month, fresh flavor of the week type of thing that everybody's talking about, they wanna see at that international competition. It's been more than a couple of weeks. This has been brewing. This has been simmering. That stew's been cooking. And, and it's been getting good out there on the stove for FPX. This series, normally, when we're popping off, we're talking about FPX. We're talking about your boy, Milky Ways, the milkman. He's always delivering from the jungle. And especially on the Kindred, a very iconic pick that's coming through from him. Uh-uh, not on the menu today. He was rolling on through, and it was the rest of FPX picking on up and making sure it's that done. And no question, Milky Way was still great. On the day, he's deathless, Lee Sin, and Xin Zhao performance. But yeah, life we already mentioned. Zhao Lo, who picked up an MVP? We even got Doc Dom popping off on an Ash pick? Yeah, you had it all for FTX in this one. It's incredible. And it's one of those ones where now it has become beyond the Dark Horse label, beyond that contender label. They're knocking on the door for the elite label in the LPL and gonna be one of those favorites in some of these matchups that they're rolling on through. Don't wanna get ahead of ourselves with a team like FBX and how fun it has been and the young and the youth and everything else that's coming on through here. But this train has shown zero signs of slowing down as it's approaching its, its celebration station. Seven of eight series they've won against some of the best teams in the LPL. All they got left on the schedule is Rare Adam, RNG, and Thunder Talk. They could legit be finishing top three in the regular season. Barring a UCAL decimation coming through, which is always good once or twice the split that happens. You know, yep. keep a track of that in the LPL. As long as we're not rolling into that one as FPX, yes, this is going to be one of these squads rolling it through a possible 12 and four record in the LPL. That's one of those records when we're talking about the teams that we expect to be top contenders and elite players in the LPL. That's the type of record that you can start to predict for them. For an FPX team to accomplish that and to forge themselves in the fire through this path, incredible stuff this split. We gotta revisit some of these preseason rankings because I guarantee you ain't nobody had FPX in the top four heading into this split that continue to shatter expectations. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out as always, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.